Thank you, Fiona, and thank you all for the chance to join you here. What an amazing event. Uh, 3,000 of you, 70 countries. Who could have thought that this would have um, happened? Before I begin my own uh, plenary, though, I'd like to ask uh, Jaron Hendrick to join me up here as the chair of the Strategic Advisory Board for the um, International Forum. Uh, Jaron and I were together at the start of this enterprise, and we'd like today to recognize two people who were extraordinarily important in founding, in founding this endeavor. So could I ask uh, Piera Paletti and Philippe Michel to come up here, please? I remember the beginning. Uh, Piera was here uh, from the start, uh, infusing her extraordinary uh, combination of wit and passion and knowledge and commitment and optimism right from the very beginning. Uh, and Philippe uh, joined us shortly thereafter. I think the first time we were here in Paris for the second or third forum. 2008, almost from the very beginning. Uh, the Strategic Advisory Board has been shaping this from its inception, and no two members have been more valuable to that effort than Philippe and Piera. They're extraordinary colleagues, and they are extraordinary leaders in the healthcare movement, uh, healthcare improvement world, movement worldwide. They will be stepping down now from the Strategic Advisory Board, but we, Euron and I and the board wanted to celebrate their contributions and really thank you so much for everything you've done, both of you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's for you. <laughs> You're wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And to Philippe. Philippe. Thank, Thank you, you both. Much. Thank you. That's really a connection to history. Um, the talk I'm about to deliver to you is this is the only second time I've been over these materials and I want to, uh, in a way, apologize in advance. Sometimes when I'm speaking to, to you here at this uh, meeting each year, uh, I'm reflecting on things that I know and have learned, and then other times I'm reflecting on things I don't know. This is the second type. I have had some ideas in the past uh, year or year and a half that have begun to shape my thinking influenced perhaps most of all by Maureen Bazzignano and the, her, her tremendous leadership into the arena she's now called flipping care. Uh, she's exactly right. And what I'm doing is taking that thinking w one step further in my own mind about what the implications are for our future, not just in the improvement movement and not just in health care, but with respect to health itself. And so as a, as a novice in, in, this, in the field I'm going to explore with you, I, I, I warn you, I'm just thinking out loud and maybe we can continue these conversations uh, this evening and through the year ahead. Um, so tiny epiphanies uh, teach us. Uh, it had been a very tough week for me. Uh, I was very stressed. Stress was the norm that week. My brow was furrowed and my shoulders were uh, hunched up all the time. My stomach was hurting. And then late that Friday night, I found myself in my car driving to New Hampshire. Those of you who don't know the geography of the U.S. will not know that New Hampshire is in the northern half of New England, the area of where I live, and it's a beautiful, forested, lovely state. My wife, Anne, and I, uh, several years ago, had built a weekend home there, and uh, we tended to go there to relax, to savor the changing seasons of that beautiful part of New England. It's always special, but this time was especially special for me because that weekend, my son, Ben, my eldest son, and his wife, Beth, and my grandson, Caleb, were traveling from Washington, D.C., where they live, as I was driving north from Boston, and Ann was driving north, too, and we were all going to meet at the New Hampshire house for a long weekend. Now, I'm a little bit interested, if you want to tell me about your grandchildren. Uh, if you want to talk about them, I will listen. I'll be very cordial. But if you turn the tables and you let me talk about Caleb, I will become insufferable. Um, it has been my habit in forum talks to tell you about my family, soccer teams, and well, wilderness hiking, and monsters, and their triumphs, and their trials. But uh, as others had forewarned me, nothing, nothing beats grandchildren. 
Uh, Caleb is my second, and he is absolutely delicious. I just had my third, by the way, uh, weekend before last. I didn't have him, but my daughter-in-law had him. That's Caleb's brother, Evan. So there I was, alone in my car. I was driving north, and Caleb, who was two years old, was driving north to meet me. And it was magic. Uh, because mile by mile, lamppost by lamppost, I could feel the tension melt from my body. My neck muscles were softened, uh, the knot in my stomach dis dissolved, the, the obsessive worries, the sense that failure was lurking around the next doorway, the lists and lists of the tasks I had not yet finished, these all dissipated just like fog in the sunlight, and my thoughts turned to Caleb, to him smiling. To, he'd be whispering, Papa, which is what he calls me as he, as he saw me. <clears throat> he, there'd be a squirming hug, a little off-target kiss, and his face would be covered with yogurt as he shoveled in breakfast, smiling. If I had been given a drug to make me feel that way, that would have been a wonder drug. It actually would have been an illegal drug. Uh, it would be a drug that, that softens life. It dissolves uh, fretfulness. It releases your whole body. And under the influence of that drug, you would not possibly be able to help smiling. So what? Well, so healing. I think you all know the World Health Organization definition of health. It is that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It's not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So there is a word to describe what I felt en route to my rendezvous with Caleb. I felt healthy. I felt well. I did not just feel free of disease or infirmity. I was well. It's um, happily uh, commonplace now to say that we could be better off in our world of care if we could redirect some big part of our healthcare enterprise from fighting illness to pursuing health, to go from health care to health creation. Now, we should be warned. I don't think we should ever, ever give up on the former, the treatment, audacious uh, technologies. These, these have brought us miracles. I couldn't have dreamed when I was a young doctor in training that two decades later we could transplant livers and lungs, cure leukemia, or rescue babies with seriously malformed hearts. But we can do that. And the miracle-making medical system that can do that, it's a treasure. It's a treasure to protect, and we have to grow it. But the commonplace claim that we do not have the system to create health is also correct. And we're on an expedition to find those systems in every country. There's a set of initiatives underway now. In my country, it's accountable care organizations and integrated care, teamwork, uh, and even IHI's core strategy is directed toward that endeavor now. But, but here's the rub. That new way, the way to health, may turn out, I now think, to be much, much farther from the current design of care, further from the, the miracle system, than we may at first wish or believe. We have commonly talked about transformation of healthcare organizations in pursuit of excellence, but I am starting to think that the pursuit of health may require something even bolder than organizational transformation. The redesign that we need is going to be more radical than the one I have imagined. I will, of course, celebrate with you uh, happily the achievements of the quality movement of IHI and, and our colleagues over the past uh, 25 years. But with equal friendship and equal excitement, I want to suggest that a portion of our energies in the design and the redesign and the improvement that we, we engage in should now shift from the proper care of illness to the ambitious pursuit of well-being, to the courageous pursuit of health, and that will be a different pursuit. And I want to talk about how different it will be. Um, I took a trip uh, last year to one of the destinations on my bucket list. It is the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England. It was built in 1675. It was designed by Sir Christopher Wren. This is the location of the prime meridian. It's the line of zero longitude 
from which by convention most of the world today measures distance uh, east or west. I wanted to go to Greenwich to see John Harrison's clocks. In her wonderful book, uh, Longitude, the author Dava Sobel recounts the slow and agonizing progress towards solving the problem of measuring longitude, without which measurement uh, ships that were applying the planet for knowledge and for fortune were very severely imperiled. In 1707, four British warships under the command of a man, uh, believe it or not, named, Sil named Sir Cloudsley Shovel, uh, an admiral, they were shipwrecked on the Scilly Islands uh, due to an error in estimating their position. 2,000 British Marines died. That triggered an act of parliament which offered a massive financial prize, uh, 20,000 pounds, that would be two million pounds today, to the first person who could devise a practical way to measure longitude. Now that problem, measuring longitude, it's exactly equivalent to the problem of measuring time accurately. If a clock could be invented that would keep time precisely enough, then a ship that was at sea with that clock could know that the time, what the time was, say, at, at Greenwich, and could tell when it was noon where the ship was with a sextant, and the time difference would be the longitude difference. It's just like if I told you, for example, that you were somewhere where the clocks were three hours earlier than the clocks in Boston, you would know that you were at the longitude of California, 15 degrees of longitude for every hour of time difference. Now that task, it seemed impossible in 1707. Ships rock in the ocean, and so you can't use a pendulum, it wouldn't work. And sea air is moist, and it's very salty, and so the, the, the works of the clocks would get rusty. But the prize was very big, and the race was on. And that's where John Harrison comes in. He's the main player in Dava Sobel's book. It's not really quite clear when John Harrison decided to try to win the Longitude Prize, but it may have been in about 1726. He was 33 years old then. He eventually did win the prize. He got the award in 1773 at age 80. From the problem to the reward took him 47 years. A persistent man. Uh, Harrison's progress was punctuated by the inventions he made. He made four basic clock designs between 1730 and 1759. There were 29 years of invention, and those clocks are referred to today as H1, H2, H3, and H4. Harrison 1, Harrison 2, Harrison 3, Harrison 4. And they reside in a room on display, the original clocks at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. It's a room that feels like a chapel. Uh, in fact, if you're a student of improvement, you, you, really have, you, you would have trouble not being moved uh, by that story in that room. Every single prototype represents not just one plan, do, study, act trial, but a whole constellation of trials. One by one, Harrison was meeting barriers and testing his way through those barriers. H1, his first invention, it frees the clock mechanism from the pendulum. It uses materials that can resist corrosion and it reinvents the power source. Fundamentally different machine. H2, deals much better with temperature variation, and it, reinvests, it reinvents the spring winding mechanism. H3, which took Harrison 19 years to build, uh, solves a problem in H2, which was vulnerable to circular motion, and it switches the repeating mechanism from oscillating dumbbells, which were an invention all their own, uh, to, um, to an oscillating wheel, and it introduces a whole new metallurgy, bimetallic strips to compensate for temperature variation. And then, astonishingly, comes H4. This is another total redesign. It gets all of the lessons of H1, H2, and H3 into a miniature form. It's almost pocket-sized. H1 and H2 each weighed 39 kilograms. H3 weighed 27 kilograms. And H4 weighs a kilogram and a half. Every step of the way, performance got better. H1 wasn't anywhere near net accurate enough to win the Longitude Prize, but H4 was three times more accurate than needed to win the prize. So I stood there in that room in the Royal Observatory um, for a while, scanning from H1 to H4 and, and back again, and I was imagining a man who could stick with a problem for 47 years and time and again rethink it. He dropped his prior assumptions. He learned from his errors and his mistakes, and he went back and back again to the goal, which was measuring time. 
So it's a metaphor for us. Where are we? Uh, among the components of the triple aim, better care, better health, and lower cost, I now think that creating health, better health, is our longitude problem. And we are together, if we wish, John Harrison. How far are we? H1, H2, H3, H4? Well, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. If that's true, if we want to make that true, then we will have to become students of well-being, just as uh, John Harrison was a student of the fundamentals of measuring time, and we're going to need some help. So I went looking for some help. In the past couple of years, I've met some pioneers. These people have been there a long time, by the way, but you know the old saying that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Well, I think I got ready. And I'm going to introduce you briefly to a few of these people and some of the things that I think they've learned, and now I'm trying to learn. Let's start with Professor Richie Davidson. Richie is a world-class neuroscientist. His earliest career uh, could have led him without any failure at all uh, to the life of a brilliant classical researcher on brain structure and brain functions. But he's also a student of mindfulness and meditation and the teachings of the Dalai Lama, to whom he is very close. And Richie has created a channel of research and teaching that connects those two worlds. He heads the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin. And there, over the past decade, his research has shown a very strong relationship between interventions that affect social and emotional behavior, especially the promotion of what they call their pro-social behavior, the behavior of helping each other, stress reduction, and brain function and structure. Let me show you a few of the findings from Richie's extensive uh, uh, opus. He finds that meditation cultivates emotional well-being, empathy, and compassion. He finds that mindfulness reduces stress, and that reducing stress reduces inflammation. And adversity and stress have negative impacts on the structure and function of the brain, but those impacts can be reversed by the interventions that reduce stress, like meditation. We'll come back to that. This is John Kabat-Zinn, John who was on the cover of Time magazine last month. John is now an internationally known teacher and researcher on mindfulness and meditation practice. But he's also a biased bioscientist, just like Richie Davidson. He's an accomplished immunologist and a molecular biologist. He's worked for decades also on mindfulness-based stress reduction methods, which are now, by the way, offered in his form in over 200 medical centers. And he has shown improvement through mindfulness in chronic pain, immune function, and brain function. So Davidson and Kabat-Zinn, these are two of the scholars who are highlighting a relationship. The relationship is between altruism, acting kindly, uh, generosity, helping, and well-being, health, adaptation to stress, and longevity. They join numerous others who I don't have time to review, like Dr. Herb Benson, you may know, the father of the relaxation response, who show that altruism and kindness and empathy can be taught. They're not fixed personality traits. They can be learned and they can be mastered. And as weird as it seems, being kind, loving, joy, changes the brain. Control of our awareness is a pathway to new abilities. As little as eight weeks of 20 minutes a day of mindfulness practice increases the cortical size, the size of the cortical area in the brain, the areas that control cortical function and executive decision making. I want to repeat that. Mindfulness changes your brain. It's neurosurgery without the surgery. Uh, this is Dr. Wayne Jonas. Dr. Jonas is a family physician. He's head of the Samueli Institute, and I commend that website to you. He is deeply committed to an evidence-based approach to wellness, uh, what the sociologist named Aaron Antonovsky called salutogenesis. That is the process that Antonovsky called the process of healing and health creation. Wayne Jonas proposes that salutogenesis should be the defining concept for a new health care system. He goes farther. He offers uh, designs. He calls it the design of the optimal healing environment. The aim of that environment is to facilitate healing processes that focus on people's resources, 
and their capacity to create health. I think that's what you heard from Maureen in her keynote and from Michael uh, in his uh, plenary. Uh, salutogenesis, it's the, it's the missing complement to pathogenesis. The goals of salutogenesis are preventive, retaining health, building resilience, uh, restorative, accelerating facilitating, facilitating recovery, and palliative, to maximize function and well-being even when recovery and cure are no longer possible. Wayne Jonas lists four pillars, four design principles uh, of human flourishing in the optimal healing environment. Here they are, psychological resilience, social cohesion, physical movement and rest, and healthy exposure to substances in the diet and environment. These can happen only if they're embedded in a secure and healthy environment and they touch the most meaningful parts of a person's life, like Caleb. Wayne has made one very interesting excursion into a world, and I want to take you into a rabbit hole for a minute on this because I find it so powerful. He has investigated the placebo treatment and its effects. Wayne is not asking if placebos work. Instead, he's trying to understand how meaning creates effects in clinical studies and in practice. And I'm going to give you two examples that he gives of the placebo effect. This is the effect of meaning in action. Listen to this. First, in the 1950s and the 1960s, one common treatment for coronary pain, angina, was a bilateral internal mammary artery ligation. In that surgery, these arteries, they're vestigial arteries that run under the sternum, these arteries were identified and they were tied off. That tying off of the arteries was supposed to lead to the formation of new blood vessels, collateral circulation that would help somehow bring blood to the heart muscle. And it worked. Nearly 70% of patients who underwent internal mammary ligation uh, had improvements in pain and function at first. Then a randomized trial was done. And in a randomized trial of bilateral uh, internal mammary ligation as a treatment for angina, patients were randomized. Uh, some got the real surgery and others just had sham surgery. Their chest was open, but there was no ligation of the artery. Lo and behold, the patients who had the real surgery had outcomes that were no better than the ones given the sham surgery. So the, so, so the treatment was debunked. The, the, the operation was no better than, than placebo, the sham operation. But Dr. Jonas says, wait a minute, look again. The actual results were that significant pain relief, highly significant pain relief, occurred in 70 to 80% 80 80 of the patients in both groups. Both worked. The real operation worked and the fake operation worked. The effectiveness of the ritual, the sham operation, the placebo, was 70 to 80%. Uh, here's a second case. This is a different procedure. It was called percutaneous laser myocardial revascularization. What happened was, in this procedure, you threaded a laser up from the femoral artery and then used the laser to punch small holes into the interior wall of the inside of the heart. And the intent was to produce um, scars and inflammation and presumably better circulation to the heart muscle. They use this mainly on patients in severe congestive heart failure, class uh, three and four congestive heart failure, and it was alleged to work. And then a placebo-controlled study was done in 298 patients, randomized. Half got the intervention, half had the catheterization, but they never turned the laser on. The result, both the treatment and the placebo groups had identical, highly significant improvement. Nearly 60% of the patients in both groups improved by an entire functional class, and the benefits lasted more than six months. Wayne Jonas suggests that what we call the placebo effect, this is now the effect of medical ritual, if you believe those studies, is a powerful therapeutic effect in itself, and he suggests that we use it in an optimal healing environment. It is, he says, it's a response not to the treatment, but to the meaning of the treatment, to the context of the treatment, in which influences like belief or compassion or interpersonal relationship intention, the environment, perception, these make a real and substantial difference. And those influences are not minor influences. They're not marginal. They're not rounding errors. They do not occur in some situations and not in others. They infuse all of medical practice, Wayne suggests, all of the time, whether we are aware of it or not. If a physical device or a new drug produce the same effect as placebo in these two trials, 70 to 80 percent improvement, 
we would be hounding the Food and Drug Administration to fast-track approval, and it will be front-page news in the New York Times. A, a recent popularization of effects like this in wellness is by uh, Dan Buettner. Dan's writing, perhaps you've encountered it now, he writes on what he calls Blue Zones. It's a bestseller now. Dan has traveled the world, and he has found communities, studied communities, where residents live unusually long and functional lives, often into 100 years of age. And he lists the nine factors that he continually finds in these high survival communities. First, there is natural movement. People move around. People have a purpose. There's a reason for waking up in the morning. They relax. They have methods special to each environment, but they all have a way to kick back and use, they use routines to shed stress. They eat less. They stop when they're 80% full. They eat less meat. They have what he calls a plant slant. They drink in moderation. They drink. They drink in moderation. Wine at five, which we'll soon be doing. They always seem to belong to some faith-based community, not necessarily religious. They, they enjoy the power of love. They have a sense of family first. They, that includes commitment to a partner, to, to aging parents, and probably to their Caleb. Uh, and they stay social. They build social networks that support healthy behaviors. And uh, here's another one, Dean Ornish. Dean is a friend of mine now. He's made an international reputation from his systematic development, testing, and spread of a program of intensive lifestyle change for the reversal of coronary heart disease. More recently, he's applied it now to diabetes and to prostate cancer and other diseases. And here's his basic program. It's relatively simple, like the others you've seen, diet, uh, exercise, stress reduction, and love, loving relationships. A 10% fat vegetarian diet, moderate aerobic exercise, some form of stress management training like, like meditation, smoking cessation, and then group social support, some connection to others that he calls love. At five years, the experimental group in his randomized trial of coronary artery treatment showed, it, this is coronary artery catheterization results, the uh, experimental group who got his intervention showed 8% less coronary stenosis. The control group had 28% more coronary stenosis. Cardiac events occurred two and a half times more often in the control group than in the treatment group. I want to mention that thanks to Richie Davidson, I had the chance last uh, fall to spend time with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, his teaching, his leadership, somehow seems to connect all the people I've just described to you. He, he, he's somehow providing a focal point, a rallying center, for a good deal of this clinical and scientific investigation of the health and wellness and neurobiology related to these issues of lifestyle and mindfulness. He's become a key thinker in the pursuit of health and well-being. So what is going on here? Um, remember, I'm trained as a classical scientist. This is a potpourri, but I think I see a pattern, uh, energy and learning of which I was, to my utter embarrassment, unaware. Many in your audience, in this audience, I'm sure were not unaware. And this all seems to circle around a much bigger idea of health and wellness than I had prior to this past couple of years of journey comprehended. Even now, I, I do feel like a novice in describing it. I know there are people here that could be giving this lecture far better than me let alone do I understand exactly what the pathway is to action here, although I'm a little no better assisted now that I've heard Michael and Maureen. But I feel, frankly, a little embarrassed. Like most doctors, I didn't learn this in medical school, and I didn't intentionally bring it into practice. I learned how to treat diseases. I didn't learn how to create health. And so here are the themes that I'm extracting from this at the moment. First, embrace the WHO for real. Embrace a positive view of health. It is not the absence of something. It is the presence of something. It's a process and a presence. Almost every one of the pioneers I've told you about labels this presence. Wayne Jonas uses the word flourishing. He calls it flourishing. Uh, other people say mindfulness or well-being or thriving. Uh, Kaiser Permanente uses the term thriving. Loving kindness or happiness. My name for it is Caleb. Um, second, the resources for pursuit and support of this positive view of health reach far, far beyond the current 
boundaries of healthcare institutions and allopathic care itself. This is flipping on steroids. Indeed, if you look at the blue zone factors or the constituents of the optimal health environment, healing environment, you can see an almost shocking dissonance between the interpersonal, physical, emotional, and spiritual characteristics of even some of our best hospitals and the factors that these others, those pioneers, say preserve, restore, and protect real health. To understand that, imagine what would a blue zone hospital be? Uh, what would a salutogenic clinic look like? The third takeaway, if we be scientists, and I really strongly urge that everything I'm saying here should be subjected to very serious scientific scrutiny, we need to notice that the effect sizes from these efforts that focus on wellness are not small effect sizes. They are enormous. They're enormous compared to effects from drugs and surgery and other classical treatments that basically clinical researchers would salivate to have. And they affect the whole person. They, just, they don't just affect the disease that's the, uh, that's the object. The medical rituals uh, that, that Wayne Jonas attributes to the placebo effects, th these yield 60 to 80% improvements in pain and function. Ornish's multifactorial intervention cuts morbidity in half. And all the side effects, all of them, are positive side effects. Richie Davidson's brain imaging studies show durable anatomic and functional changes, neurosurgery without the surgery. And to go from data to anecdote, I will tell you, I was as happy en route to my rendezvous with Caleb as I have felt in years. Fourth, these interventions that these thought leaders counsel, they're neither simple nor are they instant. These are, these are systemic designs, highly familiar to an audience familiar now with quality management, like Wayne Jonas's optimal healing pillars, that's a system of action, or Buettner's nine blue zone factors. They tend to invoke repeated practices, ongoing development, susceptible, I think, to PDSA thinking, like mindfulness and meditation practices. They are new habits. They're not pills. They're not one-time pills. They're about how we live. They're not about treatments that inter interrupt living. Uh, fifth takeaway, I can see a theme throughout of connectedness, of interpersonal interaction, which is what Michael was telling us about in his lovely story from Tasmania. Uh, some people will call this um, holism. Oversimplifying, I think that these pioneers are reuniting the theme of personal health with the ideas of community and interdependence and social support. It, it implies we cannot easily imagine a person truly healthy alone. I was reminded when I began to realize this of one of my first visits to New Zealand where a Maori leader told me that the Maori view of health has four inseparable parts. Uh, physical health, emotional health, spiritual health, and family health. If I understand correctly, it would be inconceivable to a Maori, if I understand that viewpoint, to be a truly healthy person in an unhealthy family, at least very difficult to be. And Dean Ornish, remember, he unapologetically em embraces loving relationship into his notion of the instrumental factors for health improvement. And that brings me to, to, the, to, to a final and, very, and, and really the most difficult element that resurfaces over and over again in this literature. It is the term loving kindness. It's central to the Dalai Lama's explanations, and I think it's important. And let me start with some bad news. I first saw this when I was in college. In my freshman psychology course, I was introduced to the famous experiments of the Yale psychologist uh, Stanley Milgram. This was in, he did his work in the post-World War II era, and the whole world was struggling at that time to understand how horrible cruelties could have emerged in that era and be carried out in an otherwise civilized nation. Milgram invited experimental subjects to draw lots, to be assigned the role of teacher or learner in a laboratory. The teachers, were, their job was to ask questions and to administer electric shocks to learners whenever the learner gave the wrong answer to a question. Now, the situation was rigged. All of the real subjects were assigned the role of teacher. The, the learners were all confederates of the experiment, or of Milgram's. Uh, the, so they weren't actually getting electric shocks. They were faking it. So the subject, the, the teachers, sat in front of a device. It had a dial on it. And there were labels on the dial ranging from 15 volts, slight shock, 
to danger, severe shock, and then two more labels, 435 volts and then 450 volts, which was marked with, with three X's. The experimenter, the Milgram, sat as a scientist behind a desk, and he constantly told the subjects to increase the voltage. Not a single subject, not one, defied the order to increase the voltage up to 300 volt shocks, even though there were screams of pain from the learners acting. They would bang on the wall. They would scream about having a heart condition. Even when the screams were followed by silence, two-thirds of the subjects, 27 out of 40 in the original trial, pushed the apparent shocks all the way up to the top, 450 volts. And this study has been repeated many times with the same results. So some bad news here. Apparently, in some conditions, even with very small influences, people can be very, very cruel indeed. On the other hand, the same researchers who are expanding our notions of health constantly wend their way to altruism, loving kindness, generosity, and pro-social behaviors, they call it, as drivers of well-being. Uh, I'm going to give you some examples. In one study, the experimenters gave money to subjects, gave them $5 or $20, and randomly assigned them to one of two groups. One group was told to spend the money on themselves, pay bills, buy a treatment, buy a treat, treat yourself, they were told. The other group was told to spend the money not on themselves, but on someone else, give a gift, surprise somebody. At the end of the day, five o'clock, the second group self-rated their happiness significantly higher than the first group. This has been a consistent finding, giving gifts, helping someone else, providing support, these and other pro-social behaviors lead to lower stress. They increase the sense of well-being. This finding has, has held up in various forms in rich countries and in low-income countries. In fact, giving has been shown to correlate with happiness in 120 out of the 136 nations studied. It holds up in two-year-old children. Their happiness increases more when they give away a goldfish cracker than when they receive one. And amazingly, their happiness increases more if their giving is costly. That is, if they're forfeiting something that they could have kept than if they're giving away something at no personal cost. When you put people in a laboratory and you give them money and then give them a chance to give the money away, those who give away more money experience more happiness and they also have lower cortisol levels, which is a measure of stress, than the people who keep the money. Older adults who help others live longer, significantly longer, than those who do not, adjusting for age, adjusting for health status, and a raft of other potential confounders. And believe it or not, if you give a dollar to laboratory subjects and then offer half of them the chance to donate that dollar immediately to charity, they will donate and their grip strength improves significantly just after they donate. I could go on, but this is a general finding. It's a very strong line of research that generosity, altruism, it leads to happiness, it leads to well-being. Generosity causes health. One of the leading researchers in the field that I've encountered now is Professor Elizabeth uh, Dunn at the University of British Columbia, and here's her summary of the findings. The benefits of pro-social spending generosity, are evident in givers, old and young, in countries around the world, and they extend not only to subjective well-being, but to objective health. If this holds up, and it does seem to hold up, then one design feature of a health-seeking system would be that it gives people chances to help other people, to explore and nurture generosity, which is latent, but which can, in the wrong context, under different influences, give way to the meanest form of the opposite. Now, I want to pause here to tell you that I have a big worry about this speech, as I've already shared with you in part, about some questions that have to be on your mind. In fact, uh, in preparing this talk a few months ago, I spoke with my friend and colleague Lloyd Provost, who went, as Lloyd always does, straight to the heart of the matter. He read the speech, and then Lloyd said, what will all of this mean to a cardiologist or a nurse sitting in your audience? Won't they just tune you out? Well, in fact, uh, Lloyd could have asked, why won't the whole healthcare industry tune, tune me out? The, the multi-trillion dollar industry that's centered on the care and cure of illness, not the production of health and well-being. It's not what we're invested in. Well, I think it's a John Harrison moment. 
uh, for 10 years, ever since John Whittington and Tom Nolan came up with the triple aim, which has become our compass, I have felt that that, the triple aim, is the right framing. It, it's a powerful framing for the guidance of the transformation of healthcare as a system of production. But now for two years, as I've gotten to know the pioneers that I've mentioned here, Richie Davidson, John Kabat-Zinn, Dean Ornish, Dan Buettner, Wayne Jonas, and many others, I become a victim of a new and more disturbing reframing of that transformation, at least around the pursuit of health. H1, H2, H3, H4, health one, health two, health three, health four. So we're 25 years now into the improvement of care movement. 25 years from now, what will we have accomplished? Could our achievement be, if we set our sales right, as different as H1 is from H4, and thoroughly directed at a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity? To answer Lloyd's question, what today could each and every member of this amazing global community a generous community, a loving community of improvers do t to help. Now, one little package warning here. Public policy hasn't gotten close yet. Very, very little of the current public debate, the political debate on health care, resonates strongly with the frameworks that I think emerge from the science and the study and the leadership of wellness in its truest form. You will read very long and very deeply in the writings of Davidson or Kabat-Zinn or Ornish or Buettner or Jonas or His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and you will never, ever, never encounter a word about markets, extrinsic incentives, controls, or regulation. Michael said it yesterday so well, no more policies and procedures. What you will read will begin with the discovery of self, as Helen said this afternoon in her plenary, in her speech, connecting to one's own higher purpose, awareness in the moment, mindfulness, the discipline of mindful living, and the release from the grip of meanness of spirit. You will read about unity and connection. You will read about the affirmation of kindness as a native state. You will read about what we all, as two-year-old children, were apparently born knowing, and that is if you want to feel good, if you want to feel well, give. And that's good news. Because as buffeted as you feel by the world you cannot now control, confused, fisted, suspicious, full of win-lose thinking, if the beginning of health is from inside, not outside, then you own, you control the front door to success. So. I think the formula for my audience here, what each of you can do, is something like this. First draft, novice version. First, reconsider personally your own concept of health as a patient and as a professional and as a person. Suppose that your aim in both roles, person and professional, is to maximize well-being, not just to cure disease. How then would that shape the next word that you choose to say to your doctor or to your patient. I think we would take very, very seriously the question that Maureen has been promulgating now for three or four years. We would take very seriously that idea, not what is the matter with you, but what matters to you. And my answer to Maureen, I know, would be Caleb. So if you're taking care of me, would you not like to know that? Second we'll have to reconsider the form and the function of the part of the healthcare system that you do control, that you do influence. Read Wayne Jonas's description of the salutogenic environment and then step by step redesign your own deeds in your own system to the extent you can toward healing. Third, we would have to take account of the power and the reach of the healing tools that you and your patients do have at your disposal that lie outside the formal boundaries of technical care. I'm not arguing to abandon the technical, far from it. I am just noting that if we read the science, then we are ignoring at our loss the synergies and the leverage of the factors of environment and relationship and physical activity and rest and a loving community to produce health. Let's use everything we can to heal. Fourth. 
systems thinking. Let's bring the same systems thinking to the pursuit of well-being that we've learned to use for healthcare improvement in its earlier and important forms. The IHI community, it now knows and it uses driver diagrams, for example, to assure completeness and coverage as we aim for safer care and more patient-centeredness and reliability and such. The work of wellness scholars it lies there, it's ready for use by us to construct, test, and improve systemic approaches to wellness. Start with Wayne Jonas's work, if you wish. I think this could very likely begin at very local levels in our healthcare organizations and in our communities, in fact, best in our communities. Fifth, please uh, reestablish your faith in and your use of connectedness, interpersonal relationship and in community as a core design element for the pursuit of true wellness. Everything we do in healthcare, everything that separates a person from his or her context, that separates us from the love of family, from the support of friends, from the generosity of community, from the familiarity of context and language and cuisine and literature and art and sounds and, sounds and sights, everything we do that creates or enforces aloneness works against our central aim, which is health. Everything we do that separates us from our deepest loves, from the Caleb's that every one of us has in our lives, everything that separates us from Caleb works against well-being. And finally, and most uncomfortably, I think we have to begin again to notice, embrace, and celebrate something like loving kindness as inseparable from good healing and sound health. I am deeply troubled by the tolerance of meanness in the healthcare world today, the license to insult, the license to ignore, the permission to distance or even, even to hate. I am so against the concepts of criminalization and reprisal against a healthcare workforce that's doing its best to do well by others by the license to insult or ignore, the permission to distance or hate. We are in this together, people. We enter this world alone, and we will leave it alone, but in between, there is life, and we have life together. We have each other. To squander that, to fail to notice, and to enjoy the chance that we have to help and to be helped isn't just sad. If I read the science right, it denies us access to happiness and well-being itself, to the very reason for life. H1 to H4, that took John Harrison 29 years. 29 years to turn a 39 kilogram failure into a 1.5 kilogram success. Our journey, I guess, is going to be longer. Uh, the improvement movement should first never turn aside from our commitment to making health care better. But now, in addition, we're going to need to turn, I think, to creating health, which is drift different. Uh, to health and well-being. To our interest in safety and reliability, we will need to add a new interest, and our eyes should turn toward kindness and vitality, toward mindful living, and toward connection, toward Caleb. It uh, struck me as I was preparing this talk how simple the end is for me. Uh, all the storm and fury, all the uncertainty, all the confusion, all the false starts, all the misdirection, and then one moment of absolute clarity and joy and health, all in the face and the presence, uh, for me, of a little boy. Smiling and innocent and authentic and generous and joyful, and surely, surely, we can learn what we need to from that. Thank you. <laughs>